There we go. Okay, so hi, I'm Joey. Um, I'm a little bit uh, sleep deprived and uh, sick, but I'm gonna try to get through this talk and I hope that I'll get some useful feedback from you guys. I hope that you know your security stuff. So I wanna talk about GPG keys and a problem that I think is keeping them from being used. Now, imagine if everybody used GPG, right? This would, this would be like utopia of some kind. But what's actually happening is since I've submitted this talk, there have been a number of articles saying, oh, GPG is dead. It's all about ephemeral security. It's all about things like Signal. And yeah, those things definitely have their uses and they're great. But I think that there's still a core need for people to have data that is encrypted securely in a way that they can get back to it later. You need it for backups. You need it if you want to keep a journal that nobody else can read. You need it if you want to send emails still that are encrypted to a friend. And I build various things that use GPG and that make it fairly easy to use in specific little use cases. But this is always a problem. If every, in a world where everyone has a GPG key, everyone has a key backup problem, right? And when you start using GPG, you probably don't think about this. It's like, okay, I've made a key, great. I've got a key, I can talk to people securely, I can learn about all this complicated stuff that's really hard to use, but it works. And then eventually you realize, wait, I have a key. What do I do with the key to back it up? And so here's a few of the ways that people tend to handle GPG key backup. I think a common one is they back it up, they back up their whole home directory to cloud storage or to some other backup method. And that's great, except now you've uploaded your GPG key to the cloud, which isn't great, right? So some people who are more advanced, they use something like Obnam or Attic, and they back it up, they back up their home directory encrypted using their GPG key to cloud storage or something, and that's wonderful. You know that nobody else can see it, except, well, you've backed up your GPG key in a completely useless way at that point, right? So a, a really nice way is paper key, which has been around for a long time. Back when people had a lot of printers and they printed stuff out, and they maybe typed stuff back in, large sheets of paper containing GPG keys. And, um, yeah, paper key's great. You have to have a safe, you have to have a printer, and you have to, when you restore the key, you have to be in the place where the safe is. Well, we tend, to, we tend to move around a lot, and we may not have a safe, or we may not trust where the safe is to be secure enough. So paper key's great for the people who can use it, and I would recommend anybody who can go ahead and use paper key, but it's not a solution that is gonna increase the number of people who can use GPG, right? And then there's like the wild crazy things where you like split the key up using Shamir, which I'm gonna talk about more in a minute. And you know, you scatter it here and there and you do all your wild and crazy stuff. And yeah, that's great, except you're doing it yourself and you're probably gonna screw up and once you do, you won't have your key anymore. and That'll be a problem. Um, this almost happened to me. Um, now, this is probably the most common way that people back up their GPG <laughs> key, right? So, could I see a show of hands in the audience? Who here has a GPG key or some other similar type of key? I'd, wow, it's probably like 80 or something percent, 90 percent. And how many of you back it up in some way that doesn't involve, yeah, I see one, I see, okay, 20 percent maybe? Back it up at all in a way that you can restore it. <laughs> yeah, maybe half of the people who originally raised their hands. So, even among a technical audience, it's a problem. And if you're looking at, well, could we roll out and get more people using GPG and maybe ship it pre-installed and pre-configured on laptops, for example, well, none of the current solutions work. And if you Google for lost GPG key, you get something like this, where uh, 362,000 people have talked about or have lost their GPG key, I don't know which. Maybe they're all planning about what they're gonna do when they lose it, but somehow I think not. Um, my favorite story, and I believe I'm correct about this, I haven't been able to find a citation, is that 2600 Magazine, the Hacker Magazine, back in the 90s sometime, published their GPG key in the magazine probably. And so great, they had a key, it was really well known, and then they promptly lost it. And they had forgotten to make a revocation certificate for it. So they still get encrypted emails using this old key. 
and then they have to mail back and say, I can't see what you were trying to tell me. So anybody can get this wrong, and most everybody does. So I'm going to talk about KeySafe today, which is my attempt to maybe solve this problem, but what I really want to do is get your feedback on it. So I'm going to start by going through how it works and then talk about, or how it looks, and then talk about in detail how it works. So KeySafe tries to back up the key in a secure way to the cloud, and it tries to make it fairly easy, though not easy enough yet, but that's okay. Um, so this dialogue here is something that'll come up when you've logged into your system and you've got a GPG key and KeySafe sees that it hasn't been backed up yet. So would you like to back it up? And it'll start by just making sure it knows your name. And then it'll ask you for another name, um, something that is important to you but may not be widely known. In this case, this is my family pet from the 90s, George. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, but that isn't actually my first dog, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it asks for this, and this has to be something you're gonna have to be able to remember later when you restore. So, you know, this isn't an easy, a really easy thing. You have to be able to remember stuff, obviously, to restore a key securely. And then the next thing, of course, is it asks you for a password. And generally, when I've tested KeySafe with naive users, they enter in a password. It tends to be like six keystrokes or something like that. And then KeySafe says, oh, sorry, that password is not secure. Now, eventually, after enough iterations, they get to something that isn't as secure as this. Um, it's, KeySafe is giving a completely absurd estimate for the cost to crack the password, which is like, I don't know, the GDP of the world for a decade or something. I have no idea. But um, this is for correct horse battery staple, I think. So this is like the really secure key. But, uh, <laughs> and of course, this estimate is complete bonkers. It doesn't really... It could be off by any order of magnitude that you want to pick. But the, the basic idea is that KeySafe needs a password, but it doesn't need a really, really great password. But we'll get back to that. So after you've finally gotten a password that seems good enough that you're like, okay, it, it takes like a million dollars for somebody to go crack my key or whatever number seems good for you, KeySafe will go back it up. And this step actually takes 20 minutes to run, which I'm going to get back to later. So once it's done backing it up to the cloud, you're done, great. So here's how the restore process works. You start it up, it, sa it sees you don't have a key, so it's like, would you like to restore, and what was the name that you told me before? And this has to be the old name. If you've changed your name in the meantime, you obviously have to enter in the same data before, as before to restore. And then you have to enter in, again, that same thing that was important to you, in my case, George, and your password, and it downloads the encrypted data and takes 10 minutes just to download the data, which is important. And whoa, and then there's a point here where it takes 25 minutes to an hour to decrypt the key that is downloaded, which is pretty much where most of the security actually comes from, is this step, which I'll again get back to. So here's the building blocks, uh, cryptographic and otherwise, that I use for KeySafe. Um, Argon2, Shamir, secret sharing, AES, the cloud, Tor, and this charmingly named uh, password strength estimation library that is itself a fairly decent password. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna go through some of these. I assume that you know what AES is and the cloud <laughs> and Tor, but um, yeah, Argon2 is a password hashing uh, algorithm. It was in the password hashing competition in 2015 and it's designed to be memory hard, which means that it takes a lot of memory to run Argon2, and as far as we know, there's no way to get around that. And it's designed to be GPU and ASIC cracking resistant, although of course, when you say something like this, you're talking about in the future, it's gonna be hard to do something, and that's, hard to, that's a hard statement to make, but that's what the experts say anyway. And Argon2 has a couple of knobs that you can tune when you use it, so you can control how many iterations it takes to generate the hash and how much memory it uses and how many threads it uses. Okay, um, Shamir, secret sharing, is a wonderful technology from the 70s, which yeah, it seems like anything from the 70s would be boring, but Shamir is amazing and underused and a beautiful little piece of math, which I'm not gonna explain here, but it's very simple. It just involves like line geometry. And uh, the way Shamir works is you have a secret, say a GPG key, oh, that doesn't, okay, let's go back. Um, so you have a secret and you can split it up into a number of separate shares. 
and then when you split it up, you can pick how many shares you need to reconstitute the secret. You don't need all of them. In this case, I've only taken two of the shares and gotten the secret back, and I could have taken any two of the shares. And you can tune this number, but Keysave uses three shares and two needed to reconstitute it by default because, well, reasons. But um, yeah, the wonderful thing about Shamir is if you have a single share, you would think, well, now I know a third of the key. Like I know every third bit or something like that. But in fact, you know nothing about the key. The only thing you know is if I get another share, I'll know the key. But you don't know anything. It's a perfectly secure system from informational theoretic point of view. So that's a great building block. Um, like I said, underused. So here's how it works. And I apologize for the complexity of this slide, but it's really not that hard. <laughs> so we start off, let me get my pointer going here without, hmm. Uh, maybe it's that one. No. Hmm. That's weird. Okay, well. Oh, was there? I didn't see it. Huh. Oh, well, whatever. I'll just point. Okay, so we start off with the AES key, which I'll get back to later. And we start off with the secret key, which is your GPG secret key, and a checksum of it. Oh, we're in the wrong side. Okay. We start off with the key and a secret and the checksum, and we get the size. And then we pad that out. So we have a 32 kilobyte padded piece of data and an AES key, and we just run it through AES. Now this gives us an encrypted chunk of data. And then we chunk that up into pieces that are 32 kilobytes for reasons that I'll get to. And each chunk gets split by Shamir into shares. So one, we start with one GPG key and we come out with either three shares or six shares or something like that. So when you want to go back from these shares to the original secret, you just basically reverse all the arrows. So you start with the shares, you use Shamir, that gives you a chunk, you combine the chunks together, you get the encrypted data, you run it through AES using the same AES key that you use to encrypt it, and that gives you the padded thing with the secret and the checksum. So that's all really simple, and I don't think there's anything like, you know, revolutionary here. <laughs> Um, it's just a bunch of simple building blocks put together. But how did that AES key get created, right? Okay, so here's how we make the AES key. We start with everything that we prompted before when Keysafe was getting run. The password, the name, and the other name, George in my case. And we use um, the name and the other name and a random byte of data. It could be more than a byte, but right now it's a byte, a single byte of data. We use that as a salt. And so this is just like hashing a regular password <clears throat> but in this case, we're using a salt that the user provided, and we get we use argon2, and we run it in a way that takes 12 seconds to run, which is important. I'll get back to why. And that gives us the AES key, okay? So, if we want to regenerate the key when we're restoring, the user again tells us the password and the name and the other name, but we pick that random um, random byte of data, and we don't know what it is when we're restoring. So we end up with 256 AES keys. So we have to run argon2 256 times, which means that it takes 25 minutes on average to get back to the key. Okay, so this is one way that we have kind of a tunable difficulty knob. Um, in a way, this random byte is a little puzzle that you have to figure out to get the uh, original AES key back, okay? so. We can look at how expensive will it be to crack a password if you say you have, you have those little chunks and you're just going to try random passwords or various passwords out of a dictionary or whatever. And every time, every guess that you make for a password, you're going to have to do 50 minutes of work, five zero. So that's a pretty expensive amount of work to need to do because you have to try all 256 keys. And so that's where we come up with these um, cost estimates. And the important thing here isn't this insane number here, it's the fact that a weak password, which is 30 entropy, takes a fairly decent number of CPU years of work in order to uh, crack it. And even a bad password, which is 19 entropy, which is a horrible password, takes like 25 CPU years. And I actually have a little uh, password strength estimator here. If somebody wants to come up with a password, not your normal password. Anybody, shout one out. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Woohoo, it's got one bit of entropy. Try again. <laughs> what? I can't hear you. Oh, Hunter 2. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's a 10 bit password. Not a good password, but maybe if we do Hunter 2. There, 27 bits. So that's a pretty crappy password. <laughs> and yet it's still gonna take something like maybe 20,000 CPU years of work, which I think, you know, that's pretty reasonable. You, you, the, the idea here is to make a system that a regular user who has regular password habits will still maybe not be immune from having their key cracked, but it's gonna take an adversary a certain amount of work to get there. Okay, so, KeySafe kinda uses layered defenses, right? Kinda like a castle. Um, it starts with that password, which is the main line of defense. But before the attacker gets to the password, they have to go past the plane in front of the castle, and they have to you know, go across the moat and climb the wall. And KeepSafe's layer defenses, aside from the password, are the object IDs, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, and the KeySafe servers out in the cloud. So these are both important lines of defense for KeySafe. The idea with these is that until the attacker has gotten past these, or say compromised the server or something, they can't start trying to crack your password. Once, they, once you think an attacker has started cracking your password, you know, well, I have so much time before this key is useless. And KeySafe could then say, well, we think this server has been compromised, we think your key was there, you're probably gonna wanna start thinking about revoking it, deleting data, that kind of thing. Okay, so KeySafe servers, in the cloud, um, they're simple key value stores, and I'm using the word key as in, you know, not random, not, not crypto key now. Um, so they just store objects by ID, and they don't store large data. In fact, they're limited to storing fixed size objects that are 256 kilobytes in size. And um, they don't let you list all the objects that are on them, because that would let them be attacked easily and they have this self-tuning proof-of-work system to access them, so if a lot of people are uploading data to the server, it gets slower and slower to store objects in it, and if a lot of people are trying to scan the server to find objects or something like that, it gets slower and slower. And they're only accessible over Tor, which means that they can't tell who's uploading what to them, and of course you also get transport security for free. Okay, um, there's a bunch of other requirements and best practices. I would like them to all have warrant canaries in, in applicable countries and things like that. But the important thing about the key safe servers is since you're sharding the key up into three pieces and uploading it to three different servers, as long as two of those are uncompromised and ha you know that nobody can be cracking all keys, maybe they figured out what your name and your other name were and then they can download your key and crack it but they're not gonna be cracking every single key on that server in mass and trying common passwords and that kind of thing. So it would be really nice if well-known, broadly trusted organizations ran these key safe servers because they're kind of the first line of defense. And if you can trust who the server operator, then you have a pretty good idea that your key is secure even without all the other security. Okay, so I talked about object IDs that you store. You store the object on the server by an ID. And so we have to generate these IDs somehow. And this is the last complicated graph, I believe. So you start with the name and the other name that they prompted for, and it might use the GPG key ID, but let's ignore that. Um, we basically just run it through Argon, and we make Argon take a very long time to generate this hash, 10 minutes. And that gives us like a hash. And then we can just add a few numbers to that hash and SHA-256 it and get out as many IDs as we want. And knowing one of these IDs, you can't figure out the other ones unless you can break SHA-256, I believe. If somebody thinks I'm wrong about this, please talk to me. So, so from the name and the other name, after a certain amount of work, you can get object IDs. And that's why it took 10 minutes to store the key in the first place when it was uploading it to the servers. So, like I said, it takes 10 minutes to generate the object IDs and um, yeah, like it says here, two colluding servers can try to figure out related object IDs. Normally, if you wanted to crack my key, you'd have to guess, okay, his name is Joey Hess, and his dog name might have been this, 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 and this, or maybe it's his 
first love's name or whatever. But if you just, uh, if you just look at, if you're running two servers, two key safe servers, and you just look at what gets uploaded, you're like, well, today these two pieces got uploaded. They're probably the same key. They're probably parts of the same key. We'll just start cracking it at random and maybe we'll get out a nice key for cheap with a cheap password and then we can do some nefarious thing with it even though we weren't targeting anybody. So this is an attack. And so the servers aren't perfect security. They're just a first line of defense, like I said. And they, they try to avoid this attack as long as they're run by reputable operators. They don't keep logs and stuff. So you can't go back after the fact and do this. So that's basically the security basis for Keysafe. And my question to you is, is it secure enough? Now, I've used the analogy of a castle. And as we all know, castles had a big security hole, right? Cannons. <laughs> now, maybe Keysafe does too. Nobody has, nobody, well, I was gonna say nobody has built something like this before, but in fact, when I, looked, when I went and looked, there's been about four or five projects that have done pretty much similar things, taken a few of the same pieces and put them together in similar ways, and none of them have been like cracked or anything, it's just that nobody has gone and used them very much, and maybe they haven't been as secure, I don't know. Um, it seems to me that this system could be fairly secure for the lower value GPG keys. I'm not saying that if you run a Linux distribution and you've got your distribution key that you use to sign all of your packages, you should upload it to Keysafe. Oh no, you shouldn't. But if you're just a regular end user and you want to help your friend use GPG key, use GPG, and you don't want to worry about them losing their key and being very annoyed at you that you got them to encrypt it with this key that they now can't see any of their data anymore, then maybe Keysafe would be a good solution. So, whoa, I missed a slide. Where'd it go? Huh? How did that happen? Okay, there's something about, um, there it went, okay. Um, so here's the current status. I implemented Keysafe in Haskell. It's like 3,600 lines of code, so it's pretty small. It's in Debian Experimental because um, we're not positive that it's secure and we don't really wanna encourage use until it's gotten more security review. Um, Anthony Towns, who is over there in the audience, has provided invaluable security reviews for it, but could definitely use some more. And nobody has looked at the implementation except for me. So if you know Haskell, or you'd like to learn Haskell by reviewing a piece of code, um, have at it. Um, there's currently three Keysafe servers scattered around the world. Um, the one at Purism, it's on a, in an island in the Mediterranean whose name escapes me right now. And then there's one in the UK that is in the process of moving to Switzerland, which would be great. That seems like a perfect place. And then I threw one in Indonesia just because I could. Um, we need more servers. If we get more than three, we can do more interesting and things. The more pieces you can split the key up into, the harder it can be for an attacker to figure out which pieces it needs to put together and stuff like that. So that's pretty much the current status. It works, there are servers. All the servers have committed to run for at least 10 years, so if you want to back up a key, you know that you should be able to restore it in 10 years or we've made a fool of ourselves, one or the other. Um, whoa, this thing is being annoying. Okay, uh, yeah, I talked about that. Okay, so if I have time, how am I on time? Okay, so there are a few ways that you could take key safe, and if you were, like if this didn't seem secure enough, but you're like, it's still kind of interesting, you could use it in other ways. Um, Keysafe lets you tune the number of Shamir shares that you make of your secret key. So you could generate more than three, you could generate six, and then you store three of them on the Keysafe servers, and you store three of them on your local hardware, or maybe your friend's hardware, or maybe buried in the backyard, or whatever makes sense to you. And then to restore it, you could have it configured so you need four shares, which means that well, you could pull it down from the internet and get one share. Maybe you carry it around on some piece of secure hardware or something. And that way, if you're traveling, you could restore your key. Or you could just, you could say, well, if two of these servers happen to die, I can still get my key back, things like that. And since it's a small chunk of data, which is a complete binary blob with no uh, distinguishing features, it's pretty easy to just stenograph it into, say, your hard disk partition or an image or something. Of course, these again get into complicated stuff and good ways to lose your key too, but uh, it's, it's there for the more paranoid folks. So I'm not gonna talk about this, but Keysafe has kind of gotten all the tunable bits and uh, parameterized in a way that if I made a bad choice, I can probably fix it 
for new up, for new backups, not for current ones. And yeah, that's Keysafe. I wanted to thank Purism who supported this work and my Patreon supporters who supported this work. And I really wanted to, we have a few minutes. If anybody has thoughts about how it's secure, insecure, whether you wouldn't want to use it, whatever, I would really appreciate your feedback. So thank you. Are there any questions, thoughts? Thanks for the talk. Um, would you mind covering just the, I guess the naive approach on why don't I just put up my password protected GPG ah, private key straight question. up and Thank you. just how bad that can be as an idea? That's a great question. Thank you so much for that thing that I forgot to mention. Okay, so. Yeah, your GPG key has a password on it. And that password is encrypted, it's not encrypted, it's, it's uh, hashed using a very weak hash. And so it can probably be broken within say a week. And the only point of that password is that if you have your GPG key on a laptop at a conference or something and you lose it, you then have maybe a week or so to scurry around and, and tell everybody that your key has been compromised. So it's not a long-term security feature at all. And so if you, just, if you just rely on that, you are totally shooting yourself in the foot. And you can tune the, ha the uh, hash that GPG itself uses, but there's no way to tune it to be really secure. Got, okay. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned a correlation issue because you're using uh, Tor yeah. and like, two different servers. Um, have you considered using like a high latency anonymity network because um, like so, not using TCP, but like the idea of using something like Mixmailer or Pond or something like like the same idea. Yeah. So yeah, um, there's a lot of build, There's a lot of potential for using um, Keysafe. Basically, queues an upload, and it could take a week to upload if it felt like it. I mean, you're just backing something up, and it's not like your laptop is likely to get lost immediately. So it could wait. It could upload random junk, and in the middle of somewhere, put the actual data. Any of these things is possible, or you could relay it through some complicated system. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for the talk. So, forgive my ignorance if I didn't follow this properly, but to restore, you still need the AES key? Yeah, but the AES key is generated from your password and your name right. and your other but name. Now you've got an AES key backup problem. Yeah. Right. Right here. That's the AES key. I guess what I'm saying is now you've got to Probably find someone to put your AES key. Oh no, no, because it's generated from your, from your name and your password. So this is basically a something you have, something you know type of system. Of course, it's only data that you've entered, but as long as you can remember what name and what password you gave it and what other name, George in my case, then you can get the AES key back. So we don't have to back up the AES key. Yeah, otherwise, of course, it'd be a total chicken and the egg problem. Yeah. I noticed that you're using uh, some uh, DigitalOcean as a cloud server. Now, you said as one of the backup, and that's going through uh, Tor, right? Yes, it is. I'm, I'm wondering, though, with the terms of services of many uh, uh, cloud providers, uh, what's the risk that they will just go, no, you can't uh, use this anymore? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I said that I, like, I would like all the Keysafe servers to have warrant canaries. I run one that doesn't have a warrant canary because I'm running it on a hosting provider. And I have no idea what warrants they've been served with or what other policies they might have as far as retaining data. So it's totally a concern. And the only reason I'm running that one is because we haven't gotten a third one hosted on real hardware. The other two are hosted, uh, one of them's hosted at an a ISP in the UK that owns their own hardware. And the other one ho is hosted in the typical basement. Um, so yeah, it would be good to get a better hosting Provider, yeah? Yep, so Keysafe essentially has two parts, right? It's got the algorithmic part and the storage part. Uh, and the storage is still on other people's computer. Uh, is there any way, so you hinted to the fact that you can distribute some of the shares locally. Is there any way to only do that without relying on uh, the Keysafe servers yeah, at all? Yeah, um, well, I think there is. It'd be easy to add if there isn't. Basically, Keysafe just creates the shares and then figures out where to put them. 
and I forget if there's a parameter that says don't upload to the servers, but I think there is. I think it's dash dash local or something. And then you just have the pieces and you can do whatever you like with them. Yeah. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but we're getting great questions. We're out of time. So. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all very much. And thank you uh, very much, Joey. if you want to think about this more and have more reviews later, please hit me up with any problems that you see. You know, I really want to know that this is secure. So thank you. Thanks, Joey.